So it's uh, my great uh, pleasure and privilege uh, to chair this uh, plenary session on the future of food systems. And I'm very happy that you are all here, even though we already had quite intensive uh, meetings and discussions already. So this uh, panel is on uh, research and policy interfaces. Uh, my name is Regina Birner. I'm the chair of social and institutional development at the University of Hohenheim in Germany. And uh, in recent years, this food systems concept has really gained increasing importance at the global level as a concept that brings together all actors in the food value chain from the producers and the input suppliers to the consumers. And I think uh, the global relevance of this concept was most obvious with the Global Food Systems Summit of the United Nations uh, last year. From a bioeconomy perspective, we may argue for an even more comprehensive concept uh, that includes uh, also the non-food products that come out of agricultural systems. So maybe we want to move in the future to an agri-food systems uh, concept. And uh, the Secretary General said on the occasion of the United Nations, said on the occasion of this uh, global summit, food systems hold the power to realize our shared vision for a better world. But what also has become clear that to realize this potential, I think that has also become clear from uh, many of our deliberations uh, today, that um, we need policy or and science interfaces or research policy interfaces. So scientific insights should inform policy on food systems and vice versa, policymakers should be able to demand scientific evidence and have incentives to use it. So the question is, uh, what interfaces exist, uh, what perhaps also has been learned at this Global Food Summit, how effective are these interfaces, uh, what needs to be done? And uh, we are very privileged at ACABR that uh, this afternoon in this plenary session, we have the opportunity to discuss these questions uh, with four eminent experts uh, who have a long time experience on working at this food policy and science interfaces. And uh, they will speak for 15 minutes. Uh, I will actually introduce uh, each of them before they speak. And then uh, afterwards, we will have uh, the opportunity for half an hour for discussion and comments and feedback involving all of you and involving, of course, all of our friends uh, online, whom I would also like to welcome here to our session. So our first speaker is uh, Tom Arnold, who is sitting here next to me. He is uh, one of the world's leading exports, experts on food security and nutrition, has provided strategic leadership, for example, in the UN-supported Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, SUN, and was the director, of the director general of the Institute of International and European Affairs, um, the CEO of Concern Worldwide. Uh, the chairman of Ireland's constitutional convention. And I understand you're an agricultural economist by training and also have an MBA and a master's in strategic management. Tom, we are very happy that you are here today with us and we look forward very much to your reflections uh, on these interfaces between science and policy. <laughs> Thank you, Regina. And it's a great pl pleasure to be here. Um, you set part of the scene uh, the context for this debate that we're having this afternoon. And I'd like to maybe put, set another slightly longer term context. About 50 years ago in the 1970s, the world was faced with what was then seen as an existential problem, how to produce enough food for the population. There was a genuine fear of widespread hunger. And this was addressed at the time by a whole series of decisions. Uh, a decision that, uh, well, firstly, it was on the back of the Green Revolution, which had, had involved a major, uh, I suppose, technological breakthrough in terms of uh, more productive crops and seeds, uh, and allied to uh, a more intensive system of production for those crops. But it also, uh, the decisions taken at that time were also uh, both substantial and um, coherent. There was, for example, the establishment of the, the CG system, the Cons Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, which put him, which recognized the strategic importance 
of agricultural research and had put, established 15, um, uh, 15 research centers uh, to, to, uh, uh, to do that research. Another example was the establishment of IFAD, actually. Uh, and then, if you like, in terms of flanking policies, you had in many countries uh, systems of essentially protectionism for the agricultural sector, all of which, all of which added up to uh, the world working its way out of its then food problem and the issue of, uh, of you know, the, the concern about uh, producing enough food for the world's population uh, dis disappeared in the short term. So much so that uh, over the next three or four decades, food security became almost uh, taken for granted uh, until 20, 2007, 2008, when you had the food price crisis. And then in the subsequent uh, time in, in that between the then and now, uh, we've had a phenomenon that you pointed to, Regina, beginning to talk about food systems as the approach that needed to be taken uh, in order to, uh, uh, to deal with today's problem, which isn't any more just about producing enough food, but it's, it's about producing enough nutritious food in such a way that the, it respects the environmental limits and the planetary boundaries. So this is a problem of a different nature than we had 50 years ago. And so that's the reason why we've been talking about food systems, which, as you said, uh, explicitly connects the policies between food and agriculture stroke climate. And again, explicitly recognizes the link between agri-food, nutrition, and health. 10 years ago, we weren't talking about these sectors connected to each other. We were talking about these sectors alongside each other. So that's the, that's the, that's where, that's the, I think the relevant context in which we discuss this issue of science policy interfaces. And that's the context against which uh, the group that I was privileged to chair for the European Commission was established. An international group of 19 experts of which Justice, Justice was one of very distinguished uh, member. And we were tasked to examine what systems of science policy interfaces are required for today's world. And we completed this task over uh, a, a period from, we started our work in February of, of 2021 and concluded it in, in uh, May of this year and the report was published in June. And the title of this document, this, of, of this report <clears throat> is called Everyone at the Table, Transforming Food Systems, Connecting Science, Policy and Society. Now, that uh, title reflects, I think, a broader interpretation of our terms of reference than we were actually given. We were asked to, to, to examine the current science policy interfaces in place and whether they were adequate to meet the challenge. And the challenge has now turned into how do we move towards sustainable food systems at national, regional, and international level? But the title also reflects another important thing. We talk about transforming food systems, connecting science, policy, and society. And that introduction of the word, word society, I think has important connotations. It means that policy has to take account, not just about what science produces and attempts to uh, communicate to policymakers, but it also has to, to be relevant to society, society as citizens and society as consumers. And that's what uh, we, we have uh, done in this document. So what does the document say? Well, first of all, I, I think again, another part of, of the relevant background here is uh, the fact that a whole combination of things 
and most recently the impact of Ukraine, has put food, sustainable food systems somewhere close to the top of the political agenda. I think our, uh, our interest as a group, as a community of, of people involved in this area, is to see how it can be kept close to the top of the political agenda. But the other thing that has moved it up the agenda, indeed, was the Food Systems Summit. And at the Food Systems Summit, and David referred to, to his role in, in this this morning, at the Food Systems Summit, over 100 countries have committed to what they call working towards their national pathways for food systems transformation. Now, the reality is that many countries, uh, given where they're starting from, are at a very early stage of working towards a national pathway for food systems transformation. Food systems transformation is a difficult business. It involves, uh, it will involve necessarily parts of government working together, say the Departments of Agriculture, the Departments for the Environment and the Departments for Health, who are not usually used to working together. So that's one of the first things that has to be dealt with. Um, what we have done in this report is we started it by restating the arguments for the need for food system transformation at the moment. In fact, the first chapter of the report talks about the urgency for food systems transformation. And I think it's a very cogent art article, uh, argument that we, we set out. But then we move on from there to examine the range of things that are currently in place, particularly at, at international level. Uh, and then it, towards the end, we, we come up with what we think should be put in place if countries are to, uh, to, to, to embark on this pathway to food systems transformation. We're not setting out a detailed checklist or a detailed agenda for this, but we are saying that there are, you know, there are a whole, a whole series of things that countries uh, have to uh, have in place if they are to, to be successful in working towards this agenda. Uh, to put it in more simple terms, I think what we're saying is that a country to embark on a, a, a genuine process of food system transformation has to have a policy framework in place, has to have institutions in place to support that policy framework, and uh, it's, it has to embark on it, accepting that this process will take time uh, and that, that there needs to be consist policy consistency uh, in, in, in working towards that objective. The other thing I think that the Ukrainian crisis has, has done is really bring home to many countries some of their vulnerabilities. The countries that are most vulnerable to this crisis are the African countries that uh, already uh, were suffering from conflict and climate change, and those countries that had, on top of that, some level of exposure to uh, imports. They were dependent on imports from Russia, Ukraine. Those countries are going to have to be dealt with through a serious human international and humanitarian effort over the next year. But the other set of countries that have whose vulnerability has been greatly exposed are the countries in North Africa and the Middle East who have who are very dependent on uh, the uh, imports from Russia and Ukraine, sometimes to an extraordinary degree, some 80 to 90 percent for their imports. Those countries are all going to have to reassess their policies to reduce that dependency and to try to ensure that they supply more of their own uh, food themselves. So what I see this report as doing is being able to give some level of practical policy guidance to political leaders and to policymakers in countries that are beginning to think, rethink their position about food and agriculture security in their own countries and at regional and international level. And uh, I, I think I'll stop there, but encourage you to, uh, to read this report. 
Uh, it's on the Commission website, and I think it will re reward your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Tom, for this uh, great personal reflections and also the experience of the report that we can all access. Please uh, hold your questions and remarks for our final discussion. And I would now like to introduce uh, our second speaker who will join us online. It's uh, Romina Kavatasi. Uh, Romina is lead economist at IFA, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, where she has been leading impact evaluations, um, which I would say are themselves some kind of policy science interface. And prior to joining IFAD, uh, Romina has worked for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, where she has focused on development and natural resource economics, including topics such as climate smart agriculture and agrobiodiversity. <laughs> and uh, Romina holds a PhD in natural resource and development economics from Wageningen. Romina, we are very happy that you're joining this panel today and uh, the floor or the screen is all yours. Thank you very much and thanks for inviting me to, to join this session today. Um, and I've been invited um, in because I have uh, led the preparation of the Rural Development Report, which was on food system transformation for uh, rural prosperity. Uh, the Rural Development Report is IFAD flagship uh, publication and is published every three years. For what, for a lot of um, reasons that have been mentioned in your introduction, Reg Regina, and also in the introductory speech, uh, this year it was published uh, after two years instead of three, given the topic of the report and given the connection with the Food System Summit. And uh, what I'd like to share with you, uh, of course, is not the whole setting of why we did this and what are the motivations, because you all know and they've been already uh, quite fully elaborated and perhaps we can discuss during the question and answer session. But I'd like to focus more on the reason why, I mean, what has IFAD from its perspective added to the, to the dialogue on and to all the actions and uh, pathways that were taken on around food system transformation and what, uh, what was the, what we hope the added value. Uh, and the main findings, the main recommendations that came from the Rural Development Report. As you mentioned, I led the report, but this was done in collaboration with uh, two senior experts that are Leslie Lipper and Jim Woodhill, and uh, also in collaboration with Wageningen University and Research Center. So the starting point, just very briefly, is that despite uh, good uh, progress made on uh, um, reducing um, reducing poverty and hunger, there is still a, a large widespread number of people that are going to bed hungry. Uh, the, the last SOFI, the 2021, now today it's being launched actually the 2022 report, but the previous one reported uh, a, around 800 million people still uh, hungry and 2.4 billion food insecure. However, the, like the key thing and, uh, with regard to food security and nutrition uh, is also that in parallel with the high level of um, hunger and undernutrition, there is also a high level of obesity and uh, overweight and what is called the triple burden of malnutrition, which is that also large and widespread um, micronutrient deficiencies. At the same time, uh, the environmental footprint of the food system is very high, uh, considering that about 37% of greenhouse gases emission comes from the food system, but also uh, quite a large impact in terms of uh, biodiversity loss and in terms of um, uh, also degradation and, um, and land use. At the same time, uh, the, it's important also to consider that how, what is the point of view of the of of what is the the, the beneficiary the heart of IFAD's mandate that is the rural uh, people living in rural areas most of which are poor. Uh, so what we did about the RDR was to take a rural poor perspective, and in this regard, uh, that is our added uh, component because 
the, the entry point for us was the, the rural poor that are our beneficiaries. And um, similarly to others, we also analyzed the drivers, components, and outcome of food system and accounted for critical trade-offs. Having in mind that our objective was similarly to others to achieve a food system that is not what is called the modern food system in many countries, like in our countries, but a food which still has a large environmental footprint and is still not doing great in terms, great in terms of nutrition. So the objective is to reach a food system that is good for the livelihood of uh, people, particularly from our point of view, rural people, but also provide good nutrition, diversified diet and a good healthy diet, and is uh, doing this considering planetary boundaries so, and the ecological uh, impact. We also analyze the pathways uh, to achieve the, this type of food system transformation, and we came up with three main recommendations, which we, I will elaborate further later, but substantially, the key points are that we still need to invest in uh, increasing productivity, so uh, productive farming. Um, however, for many uh, of our beneficiaries, agriculture is not enough, so it's of crucial importance to invest in off-farm enterprises in the midstream, so whatever goes between the after production and after consumption. And for those that really cannot make a living out of uh, the little endowment they have to also invest on in social protection. I will elaborate a little more on each of these three points later. And finally, we'd also analyze what are the, the foundations, what is needed, what are the systemic changes needed to achieve this transformation. So this was the approach we took in the Rural uh, Development Report. And there on the right, uh, hand side corner, you can see uh, the, the cover of our report, which is also available online. So our starting point is still that the, uh, the, the small scale farmers are the foundation of uh, uh, food system and they play a critical role in reducing poverty and ensuring food security. This slide is quite um, important in what I'd like to say, which is that um, most of the people, most of the rural small scale producers produce and cultivate less than two hectares of land. So very small farm size. Out of that very small farm size, they cultivate a total of about 11% of the total farmland in the world. And still with this little, they contribute by 31% of the food calories we consume. So this gives us a sense of how important they are. Um, and so for these people, it's, uh, as I said, it's still crucial to enhance the productivity, but to, be, to do that within planetary boundaries, so respecting the environmental footprint, the ecological footprint. How can we do that? Uh, well, focusing on a nutrient dense and diversified food production. So uh, we will also talk about consumption, but the production is also important, including for neglected and underutilized species uh, and for diversified food that is also supported by a system that distributes seeds and that support, for example, uh, storage and cooling facilities for, um, for what is produced. We also need to support natural-based solutions that are using knowledge and uh, precision agriculture, digital agriculture. In this digital massive uh, transformation that we're facing again, and more importantly, we shouldn't forget about the rural people and the rural poor because otherwise they are totally left behind. And this can be done through you know, advisory services in terms of weather forecast, uh, of course, also interfaced eventually with the smartphones that are um, available also in remote areas. And if not through, there are other systems, including the radio station, uh, also including market and financial um, information. Uh, a, a little very short um, uh, connection point here is the importance of adaptation to climate, uh, considering that climate finance uh, that benefits small scale agriculture is really negligible. It's really low. It's only 1.7% of the whole uh, track climate finance. So really, really a small amount. 
much more can be done there. And uh, we are making an effort from, uh, from IFA to contribute, uh, being a small institution, but to give a contribution in terms of adaptation, in terms of natural-based solution, and in terms of uh, uh, using also digital and renewable technologies. The second element I mentioned is the importance of investing in the midstream and in agribusiness. Uh, we know that given the small amount of land they cultivate and the large family size they have, uh, often agriculture is not enough. Investing in everything that goes after production is essential to trigger a transformative effect and potentially a multiplier effect in the local economy. So or generating what is called the locally, uh, local um, economy wide effect. And this is very important also for the labor force that is projected to, to, to increase in the future. And as we can see in this slide, there is quite already um, a, a good scope of improvement in terms of, of farm opportunities that are available, particularly in Sub-Saharan and, and in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia, less so in Latin America because there are much more middle income and also higher level can, uh, income countries in Latin America. But um, overall, you can see that all the, the, the slice of the um, bar that are of, uh, or, warm colors, so uh, yellow, orange, and afterwards are off-farm opportunities. So there is still a large amount of uh, opportunity to increase there. And as I said, this is of uh, key importance, particularly for the number of people, particularly in the youth uh, segment of the population that is uh, increasing and that will need to find uh, employment and uh, raise an income for their livelihood. Uh, for those, as I said, that cannot make it, also safety net and social protection are of uh, key importance, uh, particularly in this sector, we can also formulate, and it's being done, um, safety nets and, and social um, system that can help trigger a transformative approach and not just help them in emergency situations. Our findings uh, is also that um, we need to combine different strategies for uh, chronic versus acute shocks, uh, including for climate, because adaptation is something that can build resilience, but it's not enough when you get an acute shock and you need a coping strategy that help you alleviate and get out of the uh, of the of where the the shock uh, full puts you and bounce back. Social, social protection mechanisms can, can be designed in a way that um, help uh, increase purchasing power and support the food demand uh, and trigger multiplier effects supporting the adaptive capacity and also uh, guaranteeing nutrition consumption. Uh, in this slide, you can see how little is done in Africa compared to other uh, continent in the world in terms of social protection mechanisms. Last but not least is uh, the role of demand and what is called the reverse thinking. A lot of what I have been talking about can be achieved thanks to the, the demand side and, and how the demand can uh, influence what is being produced and what is available in, in the market. This can be done by using the market and putting the consumers at the center of market uh, systems, uh, not only diversifying diets, but also allowing them to be aware. So including education and awareness campaign, uh, but also using the market to, be, to make the consumers able to trace, to identify what are the uh, content of what they eat and to trace the, the, the process and the transportation that has as followed. So demand-led incentives can also be levers for food system transformation. And of course, here it also comes the private sector. Uh, this is the market and the rules. So talking about governance now, it's uh, also uh, relevant in terms of incentive or subsidies or what kind of perverse incentives that can be given or, or helpful incentive, because at the moment, the cost of a healthy diet is unaffordable for more than 3 million people, and that is unacceptable. Uh, so also in that regard, in addition to nudging consumer choices, they also need to have uh, to be available to have affordable uh, diets. Um, and that in that regard, also the, the role that 
a peri-urban and local market can play is of crucial importance. And also enhancing the gender aspects because uh, women, um, as we know, are always a little behind in terms of uh, accessing uh, resources and um, endowments in general. Uh, there is also an important connection with healthier diet and what, what kind of food groups are available in the different income level countries. Of course, cereals uh, are more available in low income countries compared to other, ki other kinds of uh, food groups. Um, and uh, of course, it's also been calculated that uh, investing more in healthy diet reduce the uh, the the, of course, the impact on health costs. And if you compare the investment in agriculture versus the investments on health, it's you can see in each of the continents showed here, it's quite striking as a difference. Finally, uh, one very last bit, it's also that it has been estimated that the total value of food uh, is around three trillion, 10 trillion, uh, of which two are lost in the price uh, that is available at the market level. So this is due to distortion and to externalities that are not accounted for in the final price. Of course, then this raises also the question of who should pay for, the, for this price and certainly shouldn't be the final consumer, but it should be who generates those externalities. Of course, this is a much easier uh, said than done, but it's an important point for us to reflect on. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Romina, for introducing IFAD's uh, Rural Development Report to us. Uh, I think very important, taking the perspective of the rural poor and emphasizing issues such as different forms of employment, social protection, the affordability of diets. Uh, I think that will also be a lot of food for discussion, but uh, I ask you again to, to uh, hold your questions for our final discussion. And it's uh, my great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker. I hope uh, Margaret is actually online. Let's see what our friends from the Zoom say. She is not here. Maybe she will still join us. Uh, then in the meantime, I think we can invite uh, David to give us some remarks on the topic. Uh, David actually doesn't really need any introduction uh, because he has been uh, talking today already. It is anyway known to everybody, but maybe someone joined us online who hasn't been here earlier. So some words of introduction also for you, David. Uh, David is Professor and Robinson Chair in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of California at Berkeley won the Wolf Prize in Agriculture 2019, uh, was the president of the Agricultural and Applied uh, Economics Association and uh, many other important uh, distinctions, which I can't mention all here. I think David is best known to us here at ACABR for your long and deep commitment and enthusiasm in understanding how scientific progress in the biological sciences can be put into practice. So I think that's a very fitting to our topic today. And uh, David, I've always admired your genuine interest in what's going on in, in other countries in Europe and your interaction, especially also with young researchers. I think uh, that this has always been a wonderful opportunity. So thanks so much for being on our panel and uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> thanks a lot and really. Thanks for all, all the compliments. Anyhow, I, I really, uh, I was surprised that uh, I was invited to the Science Advisory Board of the World Food Summit. This was the third uh, World Food Summit. I was actually involved in five. And it was really, really different than anything else. It was run by uh, Joachim uh, von Braun. And Joachim von Braun can run uh, to be the uh, UN Sec uh, Secretary General. He was able to uh, manage uh, a bunch of 20 people that not always agreed. And uh, we have several uh, really powerful people. One really impressive person is Luis uh, Fresco. Now, being in committees like this, people really matters. Because especially in the beginning, you really don't know what to do and we don't know what the other people are thinking. Now, what, what happened, we got several types of inputs. We got, as I said earlier today, about, I don't know, 600 memos from NGOs, mostly about uh, why eco-agriculture is a solution. 
Then we got some really fantastic uh, work from FAO and IFA that was really addressing a lot of uh, problems. And the, we have a panel uh, with industry with, that was extremely disappointed, disappointed and weak. Industry that had a chance to speak to the world and they don't. And uh, so to some extent, we have all this mixed uh, input and we have to uh, made, uh, made a position. I think the interesting thing from my perspective was the, uh, that, uh, that there was no disagreement about the objective. If you look at uh, the presentation uh, that, uh, that uh, we got a second ago from IFAD, it, no one disagrees with the objective. It's very, very difficult to disagree about the objective, you know, health, nutrition, rural development, eliminate, and Romina did a great job presenting it. The question is how to go there. And the other thing is the question is about what do we do? What, what, what do we know about the system? And I think that the thing about this thing, and it's mostly because of the FAO and IFAD input, that people really start thinking that there is a food system. I think there was more, let's put it, more Tom Reardon than Alain de Janvery, if you know this type. Very little discussion of the poor farmers and more discussion that there is a food system and we need to understand it and we need to see how it works and probably high percentage of the food go uh, through supply chain and we need to understand supply chain. And to me, it was a, a very refreshing. Uh, another thing that I feel, and I said it in many places, that most of the impact assessment that people really spend all their time because someone in Gates decided that it's important, proved to be, in my view, quite useless. Most of the studies were simple statistical studies that tell you what's going on and case studies and how you describe the potato supply chain in India and how you look at the industrial organization of agriculture. People know that farmers uh, adopt technology if the prices are right and there are networked effects. You don't need to have uh, the ultimate uh, $500,000 study with the gold standard of uh, econometrics to do it. But we don't know is how food move from one place to another. And actually that was one thing that we really got uh, from, uh, from all this group. And one group that was fantastic, I forgot about it, is IFRI. We really start to get some sort of picture how food is moving between countries and what are some of the challenges and what is the role of the international cooperation. And we read, and, and we read some uh, conclusions. So maybe I'll speak about two things. What the official input that we got, what was the discussion, what, what were the groups that we have, and what were the conclusions. As I said before, most of the stuff that we got is about food production. You need to have healthy food, and healthy food is produced by such a way, and it has to be agroecology, which I have nothing against it, if, if it's uh, more uh, open. And everything, and what I do is good, and what the other guy uh, does is bad. That was uh, one type of uh, input. The other thing that we got was this really useful information from IFAD, FAO, and uh, IFPRI about how food system operate, which really surprising. As I said before, some companies basically said, eliminate regulation and add, and add free, free trade. And I think uh, it, was, it was actually harmful rather than useful. And, uh, and, and that basically it. Now, the group that we had in the committee were very interested, and I think I really learned a lot about it. First, we have a lot of nutritionists and uh, people that really look at uh, the health side of food. And what I realize is, what I say is, nutritionists know nothing about economics, most of them. They don't understand economics, they don't uh, und understand how the system works, okay, they operate in, this is good for you and this is bad for you. So it was a real dialogue. And at the end, I think we were really uh, quite successful to say, gosh, you know, of course, uh, you want uh, everyone to eat uh, fruit and vegetables, but it's not available ev everywhere. And uh, the reality is that most people in the West are obese. Uh, 
example number one is sitting here and uh, but uh, it's a choice and uh, you, so, so to some extent it was a really interesting dialogue about uh, about about uh, about uh, nutritionists and nutritionists a lot of time are really attracted uh, to uh, gosh food it's uh, about uh, about uh, agroecology and make it clean after, but if you speak with them with five, uh, for five minutes, you basically, you remove this bias. So it, that was one group that was interesting. Another group that was interesting is some of the EU countries, the African countries and the rest. The EU country, especially a, a lot of the people that were EU and it was biased towards EU had an agenda that was some of the EU agenda. I don't understand the EU agenda, like my comment before about uh, the bioeconomy in Europe. It's a bioeconomy with bad biotechnology, but there is some uh, agenda that everything will be orderly and nice and organized with target, but it's not clear what it was. And, and they try to impose a, a, some sort of a scheme on, on, on the people. I said quiet, but I was surprised, but the African really didn't like it. The African and the Latin America said, God, we want to set our own agenda. You don't tell us what to do, which was really, to me, was very, very refreshing. Now, then there was the economist, and I think that one thing was clear, the CGE modeling, even though people really uh, criticize it, is the most useful thing that economists have to offer. Theory and CGE, that's the only thing that we have to offer. And the CDE that we got from Maximo and David Laborde gave us some sort of prediction in the future. They are not great, but at least they are predictions that we can rely on. It wasn't good. I ran a regression and it was a perfect regression and seven farmers uh, spoke with their neighbor and 10 didn't. It was really some sort of prediction about the future. So that, was really, uh, that, that was really useful. So if, uh, so after all this, inter uh, uh, I'll, 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 I'll read, uh, read some of the basic conclusions that uh, we have. Number one is that agriculture is more than food. It was clear agriculture includes all what we call in the bioeconomy, agro-tourism, biofuel, everything. And in order that the rural sector will increase, you need to have more than production at the farm level, but intermediation, and industry. Now, everyone really prays, didn't like to do it, but we pray China basically develop growing by developing rural industry. That's number one. Uh, the, the other thing is the importance of multidisciplinarity. It was clear in this uh, meeting that ECOFAS is in his own little, uh, it's in his own little square, and we really need to speak with one another. I was really, I learned a lot from speaking with health people. My only contact with health people was going to a doctor twice a year. And this, the treatments really know a lot. They don't know economic, but they know health. So if we extend views, you learn something. So that was really uh, useful. Now, the other thing, like Ratan, I don't know how many of you know Ratan Lal, is a wonderful uh, person why he died, uh, after five minutes when, you, when he doesn't tell you that everything can be in soil management. So we can really agree about combining soil practices and biotechnology and irrigation to have an efficient uh, agriculture. Uh, another thing that uh, is very important, that probably the most important conclusion, agriculture and food system is much more than farmer. The middle is important. You need to understand how supply chain operate. Farmers get less and less of the value added. And if you realize it and you take it almost as given, you can generate more, uh, more opportunities. And not only in the US, in India, the supply chain is very sophisticated. Latin America, it's very sophisticated. In Africa, it's become sophisticated. Another thing is the importance of supermarket and supermarket chain and the fact that for, that, for example, in Africa, a lot of the food is important, but the challenge is to compete with the, the import from Europe and to produce local food and to upgrade the system for the supermarket in uh, the countries. Now, another thing that people agree that small farmers 
have bleak future unless they get involved with value-added product and specialize in new product. This is one thing that the IFAD mantra lets that small farmers feed the world realize it's not there. Most small farmers, many of them are old, many of them leave the farm, and none of them want to stay a small farmer unless they have value-added products. So increasing value-added products is really important. So here we come to what are the solutions. First, much more research, extension, public and private. It's a real shame that the amount of money spent on research is so small, small in developing countries. I didn't realize that the CGIAR is only a billion dollars. It should be much, much bigger. It may be worthwhile that the CGIAR uh, would also have uh, universities in it that will develop a much better foundation for a research infrastructure in rural areas that can really uh, make a difference and can really develop a much better, a much more advanced agricultural industries. Uh, and now, given all this uh, discussion, I think what happened is, and that's what, is that it was clear that every country needs to, to follow its own path. We cannot have one type of a solution that fit everybody, neither agricultural or DOD or anything. Every country will support its own path. We need to develop much more collaboration in research and to strengthen uh, the investment in research in agriculture. CGIAR is one key, but there is a place for uh, local universities. At least in my view, we have to triple or even more the amount of research that we have in, uh, in developing countries and life science in developing countries. And the third thing was there was an attempt to develop a, a, a IFCC, something like the IPCC for food. And that's something that amazingly was rebuffed. Of course, FAO didn't like it. Well, that was the role of FAO. IFA didn't like it. But it was also clear that when you have an organization like this, it will be captured. So if I really learned something is, we had a lot of people that have good wills. After a while, uh, we basically became more or less a team. Uh, we agree that the best way to the part is disagree and to have a diversified system. And the only thing that I think is really important is supply chain are really important. Value chain are very important. Agriculture is more than food. We need to invest, uh, we need to invest in research. And actually everyone is gaining from, uh, from diversity of agricultural system. And uh, we need to develop trade policies or we need to, uh, to improve uh, trade so countries will be able to operate uh, to their uh, relative advantage and enhancing uh, value-added production. So that's my impression. Well, thank you very much, David, for sharing your insider views and reflections.